Yup. 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 That's the tone for this episode today. Screaming from the sidelines, representing the best. We got the fictional, we got the old school, and we got the team that's trying to stay in Oakland. My name is Greg Silver, as always. And before we get to all the topics, it's just a friendly reminder to rate and share and subscribe. I promise you it does translate to good. So just take 15 seconds out of your day and make it happen right here on the Believe Network presented by BetOnline.ag. Head there today. Get a nice little welcome bonus. I promise you if you already have an account, you can go refer a friend Get some money. It is worth it. You get a lot of free play money, so you don't even have severe consequences out there for placing some fun summer bets. The NBA season is over, and we're going to talk about that. We got a lot of good topics to get to today. I think if you're watching the video, it's pretty obvious what we're going to open the show with, and that is the A's reverse boycott game. Also got a little bit of hockey. The Stanley Cup finished up. What should we look at for this NBA offseason? John Morant, his suspension's coming any day now. The Denver Nuggets are crowned champions for the first time in 47 years. And then we also got some WNBA early impressions. And then we're going to wrap things up with the recent controversy surrounding that article from the Free Press about the Cavender twins, Haley and Hannah, who played basketball at Fresno State and then the University of Miami. But let's back it up, because we're going to start at the top here. The Oakland A's organized a reverse boycott last night, and I joked with a friend that John Fisher was so bad at ownership that he has made me care about baseball. And the A's were coming off six straight wins in a row. They were 12-50, and and then they beat the best team in baseball leading into this Tuesday night. And then an attendance of 27,759 fans showed up and showed out at the Oakland Coliseum. Of course, of course, the A's always make it weird, don't they? Historically bad team. They were 12 and 50, like I just said. Worst run differential since like 1847. And then they just win seven in a row. Two against the best team in baseball, the Tampa Bay Rays. But hey, it's not the fans. It's not the fans that are the problem. They showed up, and they made themselves heard. Screaming from the sidelines, or the dugout, or the outfield, or outside the Coliseum because they weren't able to get in. They showed up. Two to one victory over the Tampa Bay Rays last night after trailing 1-0. And the winning run came in the eighth inning. Off of a little fielder's choice, they couldn't get the throw off to home plate with the runner on third, and that was all they needed. Bad night for John Fisher. Bad night for Dave Cavill. If 27,759 people show up in person to protest what you're doing, you should probably take a look in the mirror at that point. Oakland! By the way, the ticket revenue from last night generated $811,107 to be donated to the Alameda County Community Food Bank and Oakland Public Education Fund, which is great. But the fact that the team put that out and put their money that way is ridiculous because you're just trying to show Nevada state legislators that they do care about Oakland, which they clearly have not. And maybe today will stink. Maybe it's just going to be a vote where the team's going to get moved to Vegas. But you know what? I'm proud of Oakland for last night. I'm proud of how they showed up. And I'm proud that the fans organized something. They organized a movement and a protest. And they showed up for the team. And the team showed up back for them. And ultimately, it was a night that the city of Oakland will never forget. I hope they get to keep their baseball team. I hope they get more teams because they do have great fans. And if you think that Oakland is a bad place for a sports team and their fans suck, then just do your homework, man. Like I have nothing else to say besides do your research. That's not what it is at all. Congratulations to 
my proud Oakland A's, who are officially no longer the worst team in the MLB. Seven in a row, keep them coming, and they got the one that counted the most last night. My final message to Fisher and Cavill, just read it something like that. If you're watching the video, I think it's pretty loud and clear. Okay. We'll transition over to the next topic. And oh, the irony. The irony of going to Vegas sports after this. But I do want to congratulate the Golden Knights on winning the Stanley Cup final in their sixth year of existence as a franchise. A 9-3 to shellacking in Game 5 to beat the Florida Panthers, who had an incredible postseason run. They really were the Miami Heat of hockey. Jordan March Assault wins the Conn Smythe Trophy. He was an original Golden Knight. He was actually taken from Florida in the expansion draft six years ago. So kind of crazy and goes to show how the universe works in very strange ways sometimes. But congratulations to him because he's the first undrafted outright NHL player to win that trophy, which is essentially the MVP of the playoffs. Today also marks the one-year anniversary of Bruce Cassidy being announced as the head coach in Vegas. And Cassidy was formerly in Boston. And then the Bruins went on to have an NHL regular season record of 65 wins at 135 points. But then they were upset in the, by, uh, by the Panthers in the first round. And that same Panthers team fell in five games to the Golden Knights in the Stanley Cup Finals. So in the end... It was Bruce Cassidy who got the last laugh, and he did handle it with class. Vegas got to celebrate in front of their home fans, and that's all good. I got Kelsey Plum hanging out right back here. They were allowed to do that, just not in baseball, okay? Not taking the Oakland days. Good for the Vegas Knights. They did it. Stanley Cup final is theirs. Now let's move over to the NBA because we got to talk about John Morant. There is still no word on his suspension, but it's not going to be good. This is what a lot of people already understand, but what many others seem to completely not understand, which is that the NBA is a product and its most valuable assets are its fans and the star players of the league. So this incident with John Morant flashing a gun on Instagram Live in the state of Tennessee has nothing to do with the fact that he didn't break a law and everything to do with the fact that they already had to have this conversation with him two months ago. They probably didn't want to suspend him eight games in the first place, if we're being honest. But now, because he didn't listen and he did it again and he got caught on camera, and yes, in the digital age, a video goes a long way. His friend caught him on Instagram Live, tried to turn the camera away. It was too late. The gun was right there. He was playing with it. And now the NBA has to crack down hard, and they know it. So whatever's going on in John Morant's life, I hope he finds the support and help that he needs. Because as much as the Grizzlies can be annoying as a basketball team to root against, Of course, I want these players to reach their full potential. And I understand that Ja does not have the normal circumstances of a 23-year-old. He has way more money, a way bigger spotlight, even as a daughter. And he could one day be an MVP in this league. We're not going to see him in an NBA game for a while. But I hope that when he does return, he is in a far better mental space and that the people closest to him have rallied around him hard right now. I think as sad as this incident is, as funny as some of the memes are that's out there about the NBA Finals is over, so now John Morant is going to get his punishment. This is a good opportunity for fans, Twitter users, or just human beings to show a little bit of empathy and understand what he may or may not be going through right now. And maybe someone in your life is not making the best decisions right now because they have a lot on their plate or they're really going through something. So let's just have a little bit more empathy. He's probably going to miss 
close to half a season, maybe up till the All-Star break. And this doesn't have to be the end of a sad story. This could be a turning point in the young career of a player with all the potential and all the talent to be one of the greats in this game. That's all I'm going to say about the matter right now. We'll get the news soon. I am sending love from afar to John Morant, despite knowing that the punishment is probably not going to be the best, but he's got some other things to sort out first. And I believe that he can absolutely do that. And we can see a happy ending to this. We'll go and finally give the respect to the Denver Nuggets. They did it. They won an NBA title on their home floor. The reason I did not make this the top of the show is not because I don't respect the season and dominant postseason that the Nuggets had. And it's not because I didn't find the series to be that interesting. Actually, neither one is really true. And it's because if you wanted your finals content by now, you went and got it already. And I'm admittedly late to the game with my episode today. And that's okay. But let's give the Nuggets their flowers. Nikola Jokic was unanimously named finals MVP. Jamal Murray completes his incredible comeback story after missing the last two postseasons. And so many of these players have become first-time NBA champions, including guys like Jeff Green, who played, I believe it was 11 teams in 15 seasons, and Ish Smith, who's been on 13 teams in 13 seasons. So we will talk about Jokic, and I'm going to get to him in a second. Because he deserves his credit. He is humble. He's an unbelievable leader. And just undeniably makes the best basketball play at all times. But Jamal Murray also deserves an insane amount of love. It's another guest I have back here. And the thing about Jamal is that Jokic won MVP the last two years. Not this year, but the previous two. And Jamal Murray missed the postseason in both of those years. He tore his ACL, a game against the Warriors, on April 12th in 2021. And as a Warriors fan, I was watching the game, and I was incredibly bummed out to see him go down and feared what was likely to be a year-long recovery process. He missed the postseason that year. The Nuggets got swept by the Suns in the second round. And then the next year, the Nuggets faced the Warriors in the first round as the sixth seed, and the Warriors were the three, and they got gentlemen swept. They lost in five games. So the reason I bring this up is not to harp on Jokic in any way. It's to say that just having one other star, and at that, a consistent star, Jamal Murray, if he had an okay game, he was throwing in three great games along with that. And I know Draymond Green talked about this on his show as well, which is that a lot of young players with a lot of potential, you'll get a couple of great games, but then you'll get a real stinker every two, three games. I mean, they even talked about that with LeBron in his young career and Steph Curry when he was getting into the rhythm of playoffs. And with Jamal Murray, you weren't really seeing that. He had a tremendous finals, very worthy of being finals MVP. It was unanimously given to Nikola Jokic, and I would have thrown my vote the same way. But just by having two stars and a bunch of solid players. That was enough to win the NBA championship and do it in a dominant playoff run, five games in the finals. So now let's get to Jokic, who is so unintentionally hilarious, but so wholesome. All the comments about, we get to go home now, and nobody likes their job. If they say they do, they're lying. They're so funny to hear coming from a superstar who just reached the pinnacle of basketball. Like, if you surveyed people across the United States, and it was like, you could have any job in the entire world, what would you pick? There's probably a few, certainly some outside of sports. But in the world of sports, it would be a finals MVP in the NBA or a Super Bowl winning quarterback. It was unbelievable that Jokic reached that pinnacle coming from Serbia as a no-name player, and he's just kind of cracking jokes and being humble. But obviously, he puts in endless hours of work to be the player he is. You can see how much it does mean to him, like when he threw Jamal Murray in the pool. That was a great clip. 
but there's a certain kind of gratitude and simplicity that comes from him that's so hard not to appreciate. When he said he didn't care about the MVP announcement this year or that he doesn't pay much attention to his box score or whatever barrier he just broke in a game, you can sense a real honesty there. It's not just the bit that he's putting on for everybody. And by the way, the same does go for Jimmy Butler. A lot of people said he was being corny when he said he didn't care about being selected into the Hall of Fame. And if he was brutally honest, he wouldn't attend the ceremony. I don't think Jimmy is corny at all. Tons of people are going to look at this heat run as something incredible and unlikely and nearly pulling off the impossible. And Jimmy Butler will go back and view this season as a failure. He will. That's not some shtick he's putting on for everybody. It's the self-belief and mental resilience of this Heat team that starts at the top. And Jimmy Butler is the face in that locker room that got this group to the NBA Finals. This group with a bunch of undrafted players and no real superstardom. I mean, who are the four best players heading into the finals? It was Jokic and Murray. We said the two stars on Denver. And then Jimmy and Bam. And ultimately, it was two teams that played really well as a team. Very well coached. And a ton of resilience shown. That's what this year of basketball was. It was awesome. And congratulations to the Nuggets. Not everyone can win. And they were the best team all season. Despite many people believing they were a fraudulent one seed. No, they weren't. They got it done. And they did it in front of their home fans. First time in 47 years. Congratulations to Mike Malone, Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, and the rest of the Denver Nuggets. Last note on betting. Of course, championship odds were released for next season. Do me a favor. Don't spend your money on that. We don't even know the rosters for next season. Go jump in the pool. Have an icy drink. Enjoy this NBA offseason. Place your bets on sports that are currently happening. Don't worry about the odds right now. Let's move over to the other NBA, the WNBA, and talk about some early impressions. First off, I just want to give some love to Aaliyah Boston. The number one pick in the WNBA draft is already an all-star. Yep. At 21 years and 184 days, she just became the youngest player in the league history to record a game of 20 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, while making 75% of her shots. She is also the first player in Indiana Fever history with those statistics in a game. And let me tell you something, guys. The bad teams are getting better quickly. The Atlanta Dream just beat the New York Liberty on the road last night. The Fever are winning games and being competitive in the ones that they're losing. And this trend will only continue when you factor in the draft class of 2024 that's coming up. So there's a lot we can talk about with the season. I admittedly am going to get locked in a lot more now than I was while the NBA Finals were going on because it's early and there's going to be a lot to learn and a lot of time to catch up. But I want to go back to a discussion I had not on the podcast, but for a video I put out for Believe recently because I think this NBA season can actually teach us a lot about what expansion would mean for the WNBA. This 2022-23 year really illustrates what that impact would look like. There's a lot of talk about league expansion and more teams in the U.S., But to understand the value in those statements, let's look at the older cousin for a second. So in the NBA, the parity across the league that we saw this year, and particularly what we saw in the postseason, is something that we hadn't seen really for two decades. I mean, definitely in my basketball watching lifetime, this was all new. We still had all eight seeds remaining for the first time ever in the second round of the playoffs. And we had a one versus eight finals matchup, which was only the second time an eight seed reached the finals. So now that the WNBA is our only pro basketball for the next couple of months, if you choose to watch, yeah, I'm not here to start a war. You will see that it's not the lack of good players or good teams that exist, but just the lack of players and teams 
The finals MVP in the NBA was the 41st pick of the NBA draft. And the Conn Smythe Trophy winner in the NHL was undrafted. This just goes to show how much talent is out there these days. And more teams in the WNBA equals more roster spots, equals more player retention, equals more player development, which creates a better overall product. To me, the Las Vegas Aces should be heavy favorites to walk into their second straight title. It's not just because they're rated first in offense and second in defense. It's because this lethal roster has so few other teams to worry about and pay attention to and break down film for. We'll have lots more room to talk about the WNBA all summer, but these are really my big takeaways thus far and what I think is worth putting out there. Let's round things out here by talking about the controversy surrounding the Cavender Twins and this article from the free press that recently came out on them. So for those who aren't as familiar, uh, Hannah and Haley Cavender played basketball at Fresno State and went viral on TikTok during the quarantine. Once NIL opportunities opened up, they took the brand that they had built up to the University of Miami. The Canes reached the Elite Eight in this year's March Madness, with the Cavender Twins continuing to popularize their brand on social media. They currently have 4.5 million followers on TikTok. So the Twins agreed to let Ethan Strauss of the Free Press do an article on them, which was ultimately titled, The NCAA Has a Hot Girl Problem. And Hannah Cavender released a statement on Twitter yesterday that read, The interview for this article was obtained by a false pretense that it would be written about life after NIL, why we didn't take our fifth year, our passions, and business opportunities. We were specifically told via the publication, the context would be to see the Cavenders as a very important story, not only in the context of women's college sports, but new media culture and business. They're building a hugely successful business brand, and they're at the forefront of a new space, and we think that's exciting and newsworthy. End quote. So there's more to the statement online. Hannah also claims that during the entire weekend they spent around Strauss, he only asked them one question about their physical appearance. There's a lot of controversy going on here. And after reading Strauss's article this morning, this is where I'm at. It first needs to be said that the Cavender twins have done nothing wrong. And they have been extremely smart about using NIL and building up their brand during this new age of college sports. They have capitalized at the perfect time between quarantine being an opportunity to get creative on TikTok and the Supreme Court ruling that allowed college athletes to profit off their name, image, and likeness. I also believe that making physical looks the element, uh, th like that's the focus of the article, that's not only misleading, as it was stated by Hannah Cavender, it was also unintelligent. Where I will cut him some slack is that he's not coming out of nowhere with the statement. Because of the world we live in, there is an element of superficiality and the digital age and social media and the Kavaners have played into that. There is nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But if you find people attractive, it's easier to gain that initial following on social media. Photos and videos are more likely to get passed around. You look through the comments and you see things that people are saying and it's very much the elephant in the room. I mean, you look at a dating app and all you really have is the physical image of someone and your engagement is based off of whether or not you find that person attractive. Now, I know TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and platforms as such don't offer quite the same level of superficiality, but it's in a similar territory. It's in a similar field, all of it. I mean, when people have commented on LSU gymnast Livy Dunn's social media asking how much she'd sell her bathwater for, and no, I'm not making this up, it's not because they're impressed with her most recent scores at an SEC meet. Is it weird? Yeah, sure. Is it kind of creepy? Absolutely. Is it kind of immature and people just being goofs on a screen when they know they don't have to put themselves out there face-to-face? -face? Yeah, of course. It's the age that we live in. 
But in summary, I just want to say I support the Cavender Twins. I admire how they've built up their brand and have become extremely successful businesswomen at the age of 22. I believe them when they say they were misled about the focus of the article. And as I stated, making the hot girl problem the central focus of the article was a very poor decision. Titling it, the NCAA has a hot girl problem. Probably not the best choice. But there's also some truth in how the Cavender Twins have played into the fact that their audience finds them attractive by creating some of the content that's been put out there. Again, there is nothing wrong with that, and it is their decision, and professionals and journalists should know way better than to objectify them like that and be that level of superficial. But this is certainly an interesting case to look at as we've entered a new age in this intersection between media and college athletics. Just all things to think about. I'm not here to start an argument. I'm not here to create fights. I'm just here to understand this case and read a little bit more into it because we haven't really had a ton of things like this before. And if the NIL continues to trend the way it has and social media is not going anywhere, we're probably going to have more instances and figure out ways to navigate this. What's so fascinating about all this is I could come back to this podcast a year from now or five years from now and completely disagree with what I'm saying now. Or it's possible that I could double down and think that, no, I was spot on with what I said. So again, I'm all here to start a conversation and just engage with the world of sports. I mean, we really touched on it all today. Baseball, hockey, basketball, women's basketball, and NIL controversy. Kind of giving you the whole shebang on a basketball betting show. But that is it. It's going to wrap up this episode. I'm really glad to get this one out. Uh, also, thank you to my brother, Robbie, for letting me borrow his A's hat. And uh, he just finished his junior year of college. So give it up to him. I think... Uh, Maybe him and this guy on the screen right now could become finals MVP one day.